So yeah, this molecule is really hard to work with. And it's funny because I've been working on it um, since I was a, a co-op student way back in my undergrad. And every time I get to the end of a, a position like you know, co-op, PhD, et cetera, I swear I'm never going to work on it again because it's so challenging. And yet here we are. The first thing I want to do is thank um, my collaborators. So I am an assistant professor. My uh, fledgling lab started less than a year before the COVID shutdown. And it's really uh, due to the amazing team of people that I'm working with that we have made the kind of progress that we have. So polysialic acid, it's this fabulous molecule. So we've seen a lot of these um, uh, glycan structures, and most of them that you've seen so far always end in one sialic acid. Uh, and that is not the whole story. You can, sh sure, yeah, 2,3 and 2,6 linked sialic acid is super common, but you can also get extensions of that um, with disia, so that's two, these are alpha 2,8 linkages. Oligosia are short oligomers, and then polysia, seven or more. And uh, these can be up to 400 sugars long. So it's a really long polymer, um, charged, binds a lot of water, uh, has profound consequences for the proteins and cells to which it is attached. In terms of what it does, we don't actually know a whole lot. So we know that unlike monosialic acid, which is found pretty much everywhere in the body, Polysialic acid is limited to the nervous, immune, and reproductive systems. And it's been studied a lot in terms of the nervous system and brain. It's important for neuroplasticity and axonal migration and neurite outgrowth, all of that kinds of stuff in the nervous system. It is not well studied in the immune system and basically nothing is known about what it does in the context of the reproductive system. The famous polysialated protein is NCAM also known as CD56 in the immune system. And NCAM is highly polysialated neural cell adhesion molecule. It's found in the brain predominantly, but also in natural killer cells. And for decades, it was thought that the, the way that polysialic acid functioned was to prevent interactions between cells just by virtue of its large size and high hydration volume. So it just essentially pushed membranes apart, and that's all there was to it. Uh, potentially, it could also have a, a masking effect. Um, some people talked about that earlier. But more recently, it's clear that actually it is involved in specific ligand receptor interactions, where it can be either the ligand or the receptor, depending on how you want to look at the situation. And uh, an example of this is in the context of dendritic cells. So uh, in dendritic cells, those that are um, polysialated, polysi is required for dendritic cell migration towards the chemokine CCL21. So this is dependent on polysia. It's not a general feature. Other chemokines like CCL19 doesn't matter. Polysialic acid doesn't matter. And so I think that this is really fascinating and I want to know more about it. Um, so in, for what I'm interested in, the immune system, polysialic acid increases cell migration, key feature and also seems to decrease immune responses similar to other sialicides, SIGLEC interactions that we've been talking about. It's also very strongly dysregulated in a number of diseases, cancer being uh, the best study. So polysialic acid is strongly increased in patients with cancer and correlates very well with poor prognosis. It's also dysregulated in mental health disorders. So I'm very interested in why and one of the reasons that this, uh, we know so little, we, we basically know nothing about how this actually works. What are the mechanisms? And the reason uh, is that polysia is actually quite challenging to study. So it's a long anionic polymer, which means that it interferes with protein mobility when you want to run something on an STS page gel. So if you think about NCAM, for example, it's got two tetraantenary glycans, which can be polysialated. So we're talking about, you know, putting a thousand sialic acids onto each protomer really changes how it migrates in an SDS page cell. Uh, and that can be a problem, especially if only a fraction of that protein is polysialated, right? So if you're actually looking at the protein, you still see the main band of the main protein 
but then the, the protein component that's polysilated is just a smear. Because of course, this is incredibly heterogeneous in terms of chain length. It can be up to 400, but it can also be 30, and we don't understand how that works. The um, glycan can interfere with antibody detection. The glycan can actually act like an, uh, an ion exchange resin because it's long and negatively charged. So when you try to do any sort of lysates, it tends to bind really well to proteins that bind to anionic polymers like heparin or nucleic acid. And it's difficult to analyze via MS because of its charge. Uh, it's also acid labile, so it disappears when you try to analyze by MS anyway. Uh, fortunately, we have an antibody. It's commercially available. It's fabulous. We also have this protein called the endosialidase, which is a viral tail spike protein that binds really strongly to polysialic acid. Normally, it actually cleaves polysides. It's a hydrolase. It's detergent resistant. It's so stable. And we actually make it in the lab, no problem. And then we have a version of it that is a double mutant. And the double mutant has lost the ability to hydrolyze the glycan, but it still binds incredibly tightly. So it's a, a lectin that we can also make in-house. We can fuse it to GFP, and I actually have a trainee here who is uh, working on uh, fusing it to different uh, fluorescent proteins. And so that is kind of the basis for, for what we started doing. So in order for us to understand how polysialic acid does all of these things that it does, we need better tools to be able to study it. So it's actually, the position of my talk is good, right before the new tools and right at the end of immunology, because I'm interested in the immune system, but we have to develop new tools if we're actually going to figure out what it does. So the first thing we did was to develop an ELISA that allows us to quantify polysialic acid. We use that polysialectin in a 96-well plate. It binds to polysia. Uh, we come in with the antibody that recognizes polysia, a secondary, um, which gives us a chromophore that turns color. Um, we can also identify polysialate proteins using this method if the primary antibody instead of to the glycan is to the protein. And we can uh, look at polysialated extracellular vesicles. So again, polysia is pulled down, the whole EV is pulled down as long as you've not got detergent in your sample, and then you can come in with an antibody to CD63, which is uh, an extracellular vesicle marker. So I'm going to tell you, I should have told you at the start, I'm going to tell you a couple of different tools that we've developed, and then I'm going to tell you one story where we've actually used those tools to find out something cool about biology. Uh, so what have we, I'm not going to go through all the details of all of the validation of all of these tools, but I'm happy to talk about them later if you're interested. So one of the first things we did when we um, looked at this uh, or developed this ELISA was to look at the concentration of polysialic acid in serum. And we disaggregated by sex, and we actually found that males have a, a higher concentration of polysialic acid in serum compared to females. And one of the things that we, are, that we think polysialic acid does is actually suppress the immune response. Um, and so this actually fits really nicely with what we know about the immune system in males and females, in that there is a bias. Men have a less easily activated immune system. It's harder to activate the male immune system. And they are consequently more prone to things like viral infections and uh, cancers. It is easy to, easier to activate the female immune system, and that leads to things like autoimmune diseases, which are five to ten times more common in women than men. So if we're talking about a molecule that suppresses the immune system, it makes sense that it is higher in males compared to females. Obviously, this is a correlation. We need to chase down a mechanism. We're very interested in where this poly serum polysialic acid is coming from. Almost certainly has to be coming from immune cells, some kind of immune cells. The other thing that we looked at with our new technology was the secretion of extracellular vesicles from cancer cells. So there have been a little bit of information about polysialic acid being potentially associated with extracellular vesicles and potentially secreted from cells. And so what we did was to um, take a look at media from cancer cells. Uh, polysialic acid is secreted into the, the media, and part of that is associated with extracellular vesicles. And this is just a darker version of this here. And we can use our ELISA to look at the secreted portion, uh, conditioned media, looking at the polysia, 
spinning out the EVs doesn't seem to have a, an effect on the poly in the media, uh, but it does decrease the amount of CD63 associated poly in the media. So that tells us that some of what is being secreted is associated with EVs, but a lot of it is not. One of the things that is really useful in studying the role of a glycan is to actually know what protein that glycan is attached to, because that gives you some ideas. And unfortunately, because of the biochemical properties of polycyia, the typical immunoprecipitation that you would use to identify the protein that's attached to polycyia is quite complicated. You get a lot of non-specific proteins, a lot of garbage, and you either have to cherry pick, okay, I'm gonna test this hit, um, or you have to buy 100 antibodies, and I don't have the CIHR budget for that. So we needed to develop a new way to identify polycylated proteins. And this is our first generation methodology. We uh, pre-treat the cells with peracetylated mannaz. Thank you, Carolyn Bertozzi. And that gets incorporated into all the sialic acids, the mono and the poly. Um, and so then we take the cells, we make lysates, and we took that endoan lectin and we immobilized it on cyanogen bromide activated agarose. So we can use this as an affinity purification. We um, pass the lysate through this, uh, and then we can elute with free cholaminic acid. And that gives us our, separates our monosylated proteins, which should just flow through from our polysylated proteins. We click on uh, biotin, uh, and then we can attach to streptavidin agarose and wash with detergent. This takes care of that washing away of those non-specifically bound proteins. And then do mass spec. So when we do this, we had 40 hits. When we filter that through the CRAPOME database, which looks at proteins that bind non-specifically to agarose, uh, we came up with seven. Uh, these are the proteins that we came up with. We tested them, and three of them in our ELISA look like they are polysilated. So QSOX2, GOLEM4, and AGR2. Uh, and these are really interesting because these proteins, QSOX2 and AGR2, are known to be associated with uh, increased metastasis and poorer prognosis in lung and colon and breast cancers. So we think maybe polysia might be playing a role there. So that was our first generation methodology to identify polysilated proteins. We now have a second generation methodology, which is actually just, so we've, we've engineered the, that endoan lectin to contain a 15 amino acid avitag, which can be specifically biotinylated by the E. coli biotin ligase. So instead of just non-specifically attaching this protein to cyanogen bromide, which is gonna give you all kinds of crap, this allows you to specifically biotinylate the protein, bind it to streptavidin agarose beads, and because this is detergent uh, resistant and this interaction is near covalent, you can actually just wash this with 1% SDS and get rid of all of the contaminating proteins. And so we've done this as a, a proof of principle with NK92 cells, which make polysia and chem. Uh, and if you checked out uh, Talia's poster yesterday, you will see that NCAM is very nicely separated from the rest of the proteins. And in actual fact, one of these down here is st 8 sia 4 one of the polysilotransferases that's known to be polysilated. So we're really excited that, that we saw this. And the benefit to this methodology compared to the last metabolic labeling-based methodology is that we can actually do this in serum so now we can identify polysilated proteins in serum without ever having to know where that protein came from originally. So that's pretty powerful. And then since we were, we were on a roll, we thought if we were gonna immobilize the polysyalectin, why not also immobilize the active polysia enzyme, the hydrolase? So the reason we would wanna do this is if you actually wanna understand the interaction between dendritic cells and T cells. So dendritic cells, for example, need, are needed to activate T cells, which then kill cancer cells. All three of those cell types are polysilated. And so if you can't specifically get rid of polysia on one of them, it makes it a lot more difficult to study. And on top of that, if you're doing the reaction in serum, Serum also contains polysia, so now you've, you've confounded your experiment. And so what we want to be able to do is to treat one cell type with, uh, to remove polysia from one cell type and then mix the other cells together. 
And you would think that you would just be able to mix the polysiohydrolase with a cell, uh, wash it away, and then mix the cells together. But it turns out you can't do that because polysiohydrolase is so active, stable, and slightly sticky, especially to plastic, that it's actually hard to do that. I'm going to show you data on the next slide. So what we did was to, again, an AviTag to now the active endo-N, the same strategy. Now we're using magnetic beads um, so that we can pull it out um, using a magnet. And that allows us to separate the, the enzyme from, from everything else. So if you, uh, I'm just going to walk you through this. This, if you take 2 million uh, NK92 cells, so these are polysiolated NCAM, and you treat with the endo-N, you lose polysia, and you see the NCAM band go from a higher molecular weight smear to this uh, nice, nicely resolved band here. So that's, that's what you see when you mix uh, uh, 2 million cells with endo-N. If you heat and activate the enzyme, um, you get no hydrolysis. So that's, that's great. The thing is, so I was telling you that if you treat, if we take a million cells of these uh, NK92 cells and we treat with NON and then we wash, wash, wash to get rid of it, and then we mix it with uh, non, non-treated cells, so these are polysiolated, what you should see is about half the signal that you see here. But actually, you, you don't. It's gone. Because that NON can't be washed out of these cells. So with our magnet, if you look at this, just treating the cells with our magnet immobilized endo-N, the, the immobilized endo-N, it still cleaves polysia, no problem. But if you now take um, half of those cells, treat with endo-N, remove it using the magnet, and add back in the polysiolated cells, now you see about half the signal you see here. And this, this is what half the signal would look like because this is a million polysiolated cells mixed with a million non-polysiolated cells. So it looks, it looks really good. It's very promising. And then the last tool that I want to tell you about is uh, a chemical method to inhibit the formation of polysialic acid. So uh, this molecule is based on sialic acid. And instead of having a hydroxyl at the 8 position, what we have is a ketone. So all of the... the di oligo polysialic acid that I've been telling you about is linked through the 8 position to the hydroxyl that is normally here. And with a ketone there, you actually can't get elongation of the, of the polymer. So it doesn't inhibit the enzyme, but it prevents any uh, subsequent addition of sialic acid. And we thought, because this was such a small modification to the overall sugar, that it should still be incorporated into, uh, incorporated into monosiolated species and function reasonably well as a monosialic acid. So we made three versions of the molecule. Uh, sialic acid is not particularly uh, cell permeable, so we peracetylated it. Uh, and then uh, on the, the made esters here, three different esters, the, an ethyl ester, a pentyl ester, and a 4-acetoxybenzyl ester. And this is a collaboration with Steve Withers and Mark Nitz, um, based on Steve's earlier work showing that um, different esters uh, actually changed cell permeability and bioavailability. So we showed that this molecule, 8-ketosialic acid, inhibits polysiolation. On the left, we have MCF7 cells, which make a lower molecular weight polysialic acid. Uh, on the right, we have ATT20 cells, which make higher uh, molecular weight polysiolated NCAM. And what you can see is that with increasing concentrations of each of these inhibitor in MCF7 cells, you see a decrease in um, polysialic acid, uh, with number three, pentyl ester, being the best. And then in ATT20 cells, you don't see quite as much. We did not see as much inhibition with the ethyl and 4-acetoxybenzyl esters, but we did see really nice inhibition with the pentyl ester, with about uh, 100 micromolar getting it down to about 50%. Uh, so we were excited about that. We actually showed that we were losing polysialic acid and not just reactivity with the polysialic acid antibody. So these are the, the ATT20 cells. This is a polysia blot uh, treated with each of the molecules. And this is what I showed you, that three is the best at decreasing polysia in these cells. And if you treat with endo-N, you lose polysia reactivity. 
Now, if you look at NCAM, what you see is that NCAM is this high molecular weight smear, and only when you treat with three does that high molecular weight smear start to resolve into the non-polysilated band. So we are actually losing glycosylation, polysilation of NCAM. And if you treat with NON, you see that, that control. Okay, so here's where we compare to the 3-fluoro. Um, so 3-fluoro works not just by inhibiting the sialyl transferases, but it actually inhibits the production of CMP sialic acid. And so you don't just lose the sialic acid on the cell surface, you actually get an increase in the extended core structures. So with DMSO, 8 keto, we see a decrease, and then 3-fluoro, as expected, we saw a bigger decrease in polysia. We looked at whether or not 8-keto was affecting cell surface alpha-2,3 linked sialic acid by binding with the MAL2 lectin and looking at flow cytometry. So 8-keto has no effect on alpha-2,3 linked sialic acid, whereas the 3-fluoro does. And treating with uh, sialidase has a profound effect, just as a control. And then uh, looking at exposed galactose, because remember the 3-fluoro actually um, exposes galactose uh, by, by eliminating that, that terminal sialic acid. And the 8-keto, there's a small increase, but it's not significant. So we think that we're not actually perturbing substantially monosilylation. And we've looked to show that this actually makes it to the cell surface. There's a convenient um, ketone in the 8-keto, in the and when you label the cell surface with biotin hydroxide, you see an increase. So it's making it to the surface. We can actually inhibit the production of polysialic acid temporally in primary T cells. So these are primary activated T cells treated with uh, the pentyl ester of 8-keto, and you can see a substantial decrease at one and two days compared to the control. And if you then remove, poly, uh, remove the 8-keto just by washing it out, the polysialic acid returns. So we have the ability to manipulate polysialic acid in cells. So that was a lot. And now I just want to tell you one of the things that we've done with this molecule. And this is in collaboration with Mo Osman and his absolutely amazing PhD student, Lamia Khan, here at the university. And this is about uh, systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. So this is rare, fortunately, uh, but it is the most lethal rheumatic disease. When uh, people are diagnosed, only about 50% survive within the two to five year range. And it is far more common in women than in men, but women tend to have the less severe form. And for men, it goes straight to the most severe form called early diffuse scleroderma. It's usually diagnosed at a relatively young age and a third of people tend to have that rapidly progressive form of the disease. So it starts with some sort of injury, and what you see is this vascular remodeling, and that's shown here. This is nail fold video capillaroscopy. So these are what healthy capillaries look like. And in the less severe form of the disease, you start to see these abnormalities. They're swollen. Uh, they're not as long and nice and ordered as these are. And then in the more severe form, you've actually lost the nice structure, and you see microhemorrhages. Following this vascular remodeling, we see immune dysregulation inflammation uh, leading to fibrosis, and fibrosis is what um, ends up being fatal for these patients. The etiology is unknown. It is linked to genotoxic and oxidative stress. There are no curative therapies for this disease. You can do a bone marrow transplantation, but only few people qualify for that, and uh, it, it doesn't have a very good success rate. So we are really in need of identifying patients at high risk of developing the more severe disease, because then we could uh, treat them earlier, and we also really need to understand the mechanisms underlying scleroderma so that we can develop some treatments that actually work for the majority of patients. So where I came into this is that scleroderma and cancer actually share some similar phenotypes, and so Mo was looking at the cancer-like pheno uh, phenotype of scleroderma, Increased proliferation of, of cells, resistance to apoptosis, there's a metabolic rewiring consistent with how cancer changes its metabolism. The cells are more invasive and migratory, uh, and there's an attenuation of lymphocyte functions. So we ask the very simple question of whether or not polysialic acid also played a role in the pathogenesis of scleroderma. 
So at this point in time, polysialic acid was not linked to any autoimmune disease, certainly not linked to scleroderma. There was no indication that this would be fruitful at all. Uh, but Mo, Mo trusted me and gave it a shot. And so what we're seeing here is actually a biopsy taken from the forearm of either a healthy control or a patient with early diffuse scleroderma. And what you can see is as expected because polysialic acid is not normally present in skin. There is nothing in the healthy control, but in patients with early diffuse scleroderma, there is a very high amount of polysialic acid in skin. And so we looked at this further. What we're, I'm showing here is ex vivo grown uh, fibroblasts from uh, scleroderma patients. You can see um, that polysialic acid is present in these cells. It is not on the cell surface. It seems to be inside the cell, which is interesting. If we look at an aminoblot of these uh, cells, you can see that polysialic acid is present uh, in the, the limited and the early diffuse. These are representative. There is a wide range of polysialic acid in skin from different patients. But this protein is not NCAM. And so we are working to figure out what that protein is with the hope. We actually think it's more than one protein. We frequently see these two bands here uh, and sometimes see these smears. And we're wondering if they're different proteins, maybe hinting at different mechanisms. We looked at the expression of the two polysilotransferases, SD8 SIA2 and SD8 SIA4, in patients. Uh, SD8 SIA2 is uh, very strongly upregulated, about 12 to 13 fold in patients with early diffuse scleroderma compared to the controls. And SD8 SIA4 is upregulated about six fold. So both enzymes upregulated. Polysia might be regulated by FOXO1. This is um, a transcription factor that is upregulated in patients with scleroderma in response um, to oxidative stress, uh, DNA damage. So what we did was to take cells from people with early diffuse scleroderma and treated with a FOXO1 inhibitor and saw a decrease in the expression of SD8 SIA2 and SD8 SIA4. So inhibiting FOXO1 inhibits the expression of the polysialyl transferases. Polysia might also contribute to the pathogenicity of this disease. So uh, we can take healthy cells and when we treat them with TGF-beta, we can induce a pro-fibrotic phenotype. So we're looking here at fibronectin and at collagen. So when you treat healthy cells with TGF-beta, what you actually see is an increase in the expression of SD8 SIA2. Not SD8 SIA4 though, something different going on there. And so then what we did was we took um, these cells and we looked at whether or not inhibiting the formation of polysia with that 8-keto molecule would, would have an effect on those pro-fibrotic markers. So here are the healthy cells without TGF-beta. Adding 8-ketosialic acid doesn't do anything really to the markers of fibrosis. If you treat with TGF-beta-1, like over here, you can see the increase in markers of fibrosis. This data is hot off the press, by the way. That's why there are no air bars or anything on it. So be kind. Uh, but then when you treat with 8-ketosialic acid, you inhibit the increase of those pro-fibrotic markers. So it suggests that polysialic acid might actually be involved in um, development of the pathogenic features of this disease. And then uh, we looked at whether or not polysialic acid was increased in the serum of these patients. We'd been doing this with, with cancer patients and we'd seen that uh, polysia increases in people who have uh, poor prognosis. And so we did that here. Um, so healthy controls, and again, we've disaggregated by, by sex. Males still have higher um, polysia than females. And what you can see is that in patients with scleroderma, there is a very strong uh, increase in the amount of polysia that's in the serum. This could be coming from the fibroblasts, which could be secreting polysia, could also come from a dysregulated immune system. What's really interesting, though, is that the difference that we see is far greater in women than in men. Okay, so to summarize, um, we now have the tools to quantify polysia, polysiolated proteins, and polysiolated EVs. Uh, we have the ability to identify polysiolated proteins in cells and serum. We can also inhibit polysiolation with this small molecule.
We are working on investigating the source of these sex differences in polysia, uh, identifying polysiolated protein in different cells um, and serum in health and disease. And then we are working on figuring out the mechanisms by which polysia contributes to immune function and dysregulation. So again, I just want to thank the people, this is Lamia and, and Mo, the people who did the work that I talked about, Carmona, Talia, and Sogand. Uh, my lab, my absolutely amazing collaborators, Nick is doing proteomics, Mark, Steve, and Warren helped with the eight keto, uh, and Warren's just longtime collaborator. It's really nice to have a lab next door. Uh, and I really want to thank all of you for your attention.